Hi, this is Lynn Hunter, L-L-Y-N-H-U-N-T-E-R, and today I'm going to finish off, this is the third of um, some commission pieces that I've been doing that um, I wanted to show you and talk about being a professional artist while I'm doing them um, right now. Um, this is my reference material. We're going to do a chimera. I think that's the way it pronounces it, C-H-I-M-E-R-A, and I've never known whether you pronounce it chimera. Cam camera or Myra, but this guy right down here. Uh, yeah, of course I'm gonna touch the screen. Um, let me see here if I can get the glare off there. My apologies. Um, but this guy, he's got a head of a lion, the center of a goat, and the tail of a snake. And he was the child of Kidna. I'm trying to think of the other monster that um, it's not coming to my head right now. But um, basically, Belfron is the hero who killed him. Um, but for some reason, um, it he had the, the head of the lion, um, the tail of a snake, and the center of him was a goat. And supposedly, from what the legend that I understand, um, the goat head was the only one that breathed fire. Sometimes you'll see them, that all the heads are breathing fire, but... Um, according to Greek mythology, it was just the, uh, goat head that, that, um, breathed fire. Um, I guess Homer said that he had fire all around it and it was part of, uh, um, the Odyssey as well. Um, there was a, um, talk of the chimera or the chimera, um, chimera. Again, my Greek sucks, so um, if you speak Greek better than I do, my apologies. Um, but anyways, um, this is commission I'm doing for a friend who requested it. And what we're going to do is I'm going to uh, do a little bit of a description of you know what I'm doing when I'm drawing here, as well as do a little bit of storytelling. Um, I had um, two other videos previous to this one where I was um, working on these commissions. And I did a little bit of storytelling about um, what it was like to work in animation. Um, and I'm gonna draw my my chimera while I'm talking about it. And what I'm doing right now is I'm laying down. Um, because of course, I don't know how I do this. My kneaded eraser has gone elsewhere. Um, problem with kneaded erasers, um, I talk about my favorite tool regularly, um, and pull it out. This is, this one particular one is from Blick. Um, what I usually do is, um, I'll, um, get a big square. This is like a, um, a two inch square. And then I'll take a scissors and I'll just cut a piece off, um, from the pack. Now you can get kneaded erasers at Staples um, in a pack, usually with uh, another eraser. They'll, but they, they come in a cellophane pack first. You take the cellophane off and then you um, use them like Silly Putty. If you've ever played with Silly Putty, um, basically this is um, latex or rubber that has had air whipped into it and it comes out like dough. And in the Renaissance, the the artists used to use bread dough as an eraser. And uh, this is just the substitute we have nowadays for bread dough because it works so much better. Ah, now, of course, um, with a kneaded eraser, I just found mine. It's, it was on the floor. Um, they're like rubber balls. They have some stickiness to them, so they will stick to you sometimes. They will bounce. Literally, they bounce. Um, so they will, they have a, a tendency to end up on the floor. If you have used one of these and you get it into the carpet, Goo Gone will dissolve latex. So that'll, if you ever get one of these into your clothing, um, which it really doesn't matter. I mean, it's like if I stick it on my clothing, it doesn't do anything. Um, it will occasionally get hair, cat hair to, in it. It will, if it gets stuff in it, you just kind of, um, again, pull it apart and stuff and like just pull out whatever gets into it and throw that away and it's perfectly fine again. 
So um, they'll last for a pretty good long time, but once they get too much graphite in them, um, they eventually get black and they won't pick up any graphite anymore because they're so full of graphite. Um, but it, ever since I discovered them when I was a kid in junior high school, it was like, oh my word, it has been one of my favorite tools, especially when you like to work in pencil because it will do what I call ghosting back. So I will set up my drawing. We're going to set up, um, basically when I set up a drawing, um, I'm not sure where I'm putting everything. And I like to be loose about it so that I'm feeling, I'm more or less feeling where I'm putting things. Like the, the um, rib cage of the lion is here and his hips are here. And um, I'm doing kind of the, the same pose. We're going to put him in a kind of a stance where um, I want his uh, his legs to be on the ground. And with, with lions, they have their heel is back here and like their knee is up here. They've got long feet in the back. They are analogous to our, our hips and knees and, and ankles. They're just longer and they stand on their toes. So when, when you start learning about anatomy, um, one of my recommendations, learn how to draw animals by drawing animals. Go online. It's like, you saw me, I, 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 have, I have my reference material here. You know, we've got all these nice little, you know, photographs that I've got on my iPad. Most of you, I don't know anybody nowadays who doesn't have a smartphone. Um, use your smartphone, use your computer. Um, I have a huge library. I've had books forever. Um, I'm, I'm a book person. I've, and I have magazines that I've torn apart over the years. And, um, let's see, I think I want another, I'm going to put his other foot here. I was going to have one of his, his feet standing up, but hang on here. I'm losing my music in the background. There we go. Sorry. I like, um, the, if you look down, um, it's Ixon is the name of the electronic music that I like. It's kind of a sun, sunshiny, funny, not funny, fun music that I like to listen to. Um, but I like to have that on in the background just because it's, it's nice to have background music. Um, everything's falling all over my desk right now. Um, and the other thing I've discovered is my desk has a slight roll to it. So when I'm using pencils, of course, my pencils are going to roll. Um, but anyways, so we're going to have our lion in his mane here. Um, I'm thinking maybe put his feet down here. And lions have pretty robust legs. They're pretty strong. So they're a bit beefy on the beefy side. And the thing is, again, what I was saying about drawing animals, um, I've drawn lots and lots and lots of animals. And what happens is every time you draw something, a piece of that will stick in your brain. You know, you're looking at the photographs and the more that you draw from photographs, the more you draw from life, the more that information will stay in your brain, but don't expect it to completely stay in your brain. That's why I also have reference material. Because if you want to get something done right, you know, reference it. Um, the other thing is, is that the snake that I've got here, this is a, um, it's called a meadow viper. It's um, a uh, Greek meadow viper. And they are, they're pretty amazing. I mean, I was looking at, um, um, I'm used to the diamondback. I live, uh, I grew up in Arizona and I live in California. So the thing is, I'm used to um, good old rattlesnake diamondback or sidewinder. And this um, meadow viper, which I would assume would be in the same family because um, the... Uh, um, the uh, 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 rattlesnake and uh, um, this are uh, probably in the same family, just one's European and one's uh, um, 
North American. But uh, I have a funny feeling that, that they, they are related. But right now, okay, so I've got, I'm starting, you can see, I'm, I'm getting the snake in here. And I've got the back on our lion. And I'm going to give him a bigger mane, give him a bigger chest in the front. So, and I want him to give him a more regal head. So I'm putting this up here. I've got, I've got a reference as I'm looking off screen to, uh, I've got a very regal looking lion that I've got for reference. And again, um, when you've been drawing um, animals for a while, you get a feeling and a sense of how to draw them so that when you have reference material, it it's like, okay, it wakes up a portion of your brain that has drawn that type of creature before and you can more or less figure out how to do it yourself a lot easier the second and the third and the fourth time around it's like oh yeah yeah I remember how to do that and I remember the proportions were about here and by using reference material off screen that helps to make sure that you're you're more on what I call on model. I work in animation, so it's like when something is is looks like it's supposed to look like the standard term is it is on model because it looks you you use model sheets in order to make sure that everything looks the same, so everybody draws the characters the same way. And so when you draw something that everybody looks likes, it looks like it's supposed to look. It's called drawing on model. So there I'm, I'm getting my, my lion so it's on model. So you, but you can tell it's very, very scribbly. It's a very loose. I'm get, getting a gist of placement when I do this. I'm not, I'm not being precise or exact yet. I'm getting an idea of, okay, I want it about here and I want it about there. So what I'm doing is I'm getting a flow. I'm just letting my, my hand take the, the, pencil where it needs to go and while I'm doing that I'm getting kind of a dancey feel for what I want and it's like how do I show that I'm thinking about the goat now and it's like he's got to be kind of spitting flame so maybe I'm gonna spit up flame here like that and in, in like some uh to some design he like frame, like he's not shooting it out straight. It's just coming out of his mouth. Or kind of in a any design fashion. This this is kind of a design fashion anyways. Snake's snake's a bit big. I'm gonna take that tail down this weave down just a little bit. But I like the again, I'm I'm setting up a flow of a line. So it's, it's like it, it kind of rolls in there, but it's there. That's a little bit, because I felt it was a little bit too far out before. And this isn't perfect or anything, because again, this is a very, very quick sketch. Um, I'm charging my client 20 bucks for this because it's not taking me any time. I'm, he doesn't get approval of it. All, all he's doing is he's saying, okay, I want a chimera. And I'm saying, I'm doing a sketch for you for 20 bucks. In other words, you don't get to say yes, no, or maybe you're just paying me $20 to do a sketch of something. That way I'm not um, having to um, be beholding to anybody. I'm not being art directed. I'm just giving you a sketch of something. And that's, that's my standard. It's like, okay, if I can do a quick sketch of something for you, 20 bucks. Um, because it's not taking me more than, you know, half hour, 30 minutes to do it. I throw it in an envelope, it's gone. No big deal. Um, I do that when I'm at conventions too. Just because, hey, I can do it in 10, 15 minutes, do, do you a nice drawing. And um, what I'm doing right now, I, and I didn't say anything about this, my apologies. Um, I'm go doing what I call ghosting back. You take the drawing, you've just finished doing your rough underdrawing. And then you take your kneaded eraser and you take almost the entire drawing away 
And what it does is it leaves the ghost of the drawing underneath. You can still see um, the pencil lines underneath. So they're my skeleton. They're my body to work off of. I can see the proportions are still in there. And that's where I work on this. And this one is taking just a little bit more because um, I've got three heads in here. So it's more like doing um, three characters. Um, but let's see. I'm going to start with the lion here. And the most important thing whenever I'm doing characters or whenever I'm doing drawings with characters in them, it's always the face and the eyes. You get the face and the eyes right, you get the whole thing right. And of course my my lead breaks on me. What else is new? Um, and that's the other thing too. And I say, you know, the lead breaks on me. What else is new? When things go wrong, um, what you've got to do is know how to fix them. It's not so much doing everything right all the time, but a lot of times it's about learning how to fix your errors. And as you go along and you learn how to fix mistakes, um, that makes everything easier because then you don't worry about making the mistakes if you know how to fix them. Um, with, uh, like with this type of pencil, if I really made a mistake that I didn't like, um, uh, almost anything on paper can be corrected with a knife blade with, or with a razor, the, an exacto style or, um, scalpel style razor blade, um, can be, the paper can be scraped away. You know, you don't cut it away. You just scrape off the surface and most papers, if you use a good paper can do that. Uh, and I didn't say, because I said early in one of the earlier visit videos, the paper that I'm currently using, this particular paper, is Ingram animation paper. You can still get it at a um, store online called Footloose, carries Ingram animation paper. And it is the most marvelous surface in the world to draw on. Um, this particular paper I'm drawing right on right now used to be Disney's animation paper. They would um, um, basically get reams of the stuff for you to draw on. When I was a, a storyboard artist, they would print the storyboards on this paper. And I swear it was heaven all day long um, drawing on Ingram animation paper. It was like, one of the things that I don't appreciate about um, drawing on computer nowadays, I have to do a lot of my work on computer. Um, I work on a program called Toon Boom Storyboard Pro, is what we use primarily in the animation industry for storyboards. And you have to draw on either um, a Wac Wacom tablet or most people draw on a Cintiq. And I am not fond of drawing on glass. I, I use um, um, an Elcom paper feel. Um, it's a, a plastic uh, um, film that you put on top of the uh, um, uh, screen to make it feel like somewhat like paper. It's not really, but it's it's better than than just the straight texture of the uh, the um, um, screen itself but anyways I miss drawing on paper this is heaven for me is whenever I get to pull out the paper and do sketching that's the other thing it's like oh you, you want to pay me to have fun and that's the other thing, too. It's like a lot of people don't feel that, you know, um, actually 20 bucks for something like this is pretty dang cheap. Um, the thing is, is people don't feel that, um, you know, when it takes you no time to do something, what's the value in that? When you're charging for your art, what do you charge for your art? What is the value in your art? Um, I'm Whenever I'm drawing and I do something in 20 minutes, I always say, you know, that's... 63 years and 20 minutes that it took to do that drawing and people still think especially if you're an artist that you are born with an ability 
you were born with that talent. You know, why should I pay you for something, number one, you enjoy doing or something that you were born capable of doing? You know, um, you didn't have to work to do that, which is really, really frustrating um, because most artists work their brains out most of their life to get to the point where they do work that looks like they didn't have to work to do it. Um, I, uh, it, it's one of those things where it, it's, I always say, you know, people who don't do art feel that, you know, artists were born with six fingers, you know, because you were just born with an ability that, that somebody gave to you. And I think with my, my, um, relative response to that is that we were born with a good memory. We were born with um, ability to um, understand spatial relationships. Um, we were born with an ability to um, see colors better. Um, but even then, you have to learn to see colors. Man, that was one thing that I never thought was really true, but you do have to learn how to see color. Um, you know, some people just can't see the same amount of color that other people can see. And that's, that's an ability that you might have as well that helps you become an artist. But we have to train those abilities. And it's very frustrating when we've worked so hard for so many years and you've got a computer now that, oh, the computer can learn how to see color. It learns how to, you know see or decide what taste is because of, you know, um, whatever, uh, say, um, a popular drawing or a popular image was on the internet, they can determine, oh, this is considered a good image or this is considered a bad image. Um, uh, I've played with um, artificial intelligence and it is scary stuff is very scary stuff because of what it can generate in a few moments um, that it has taken you years and years and years and years and years to perfect and on top of that um, on top of the fact that that it can do something that has taken you years and years and years and years to do that will take you days and days to create it takes literal seconds that's scarier than heck um, and on top of that, you know, it's like, it, it would be one thing if I didn't make a living at this, you know, it's, it, it's one thing when art is uh, a passion, which it always is. But, um, there are, are those of you out there that also, I'm sure would like to make a living at this. Um, and I was talking earlier about, you know, number one, um, you can still make a living at this. AI hasn't taken over yet. And what you have to do is learn to adapt. Um, I started out as um, basically a paste-up artist. They used to use um, uh, wax and something called rubber cement. And type came out of a, uh, a uh, um, camera. And actually you um, made camera, type would come out off of a typesetter. And even before then it was type came from lead, right? Or you'd, you'd have to go to a typesetter, have them print up um, the letters that you'd want for graphic design, and you'd have to spec it out. I mean, I don't have to do type specking anymore. Nobody on this, this website, probably, if you're listening to this, even knows what type specking is. You know, it's, it's like you have to learn how to code now. Well, you used to have to learn how to spec type. And technology changes and you really really have to adjust with the technology with what people want for art um, if VR is the next best thing learn to do VR if um, 3d animation is the the next best thing um, learn how to do 3d animation learn how to do whatever it is that they want at the given moment because you can do that. If you're an artist, you can do that. And you'll find a way to make your talent and what you like to do um, be something that somebody wants to pay you money to do. 
Um, when I discovered storyboarding, it was like I died and gone to heaven. Because I thought, you know, with animation, you have, I've done both. But when you do animation, you're doing lots and lots of drawings to get to just the point where um, your um, drawings come to life. When you're storyboarding, it used to be a lot less. Oh man, it was, it was more like doing a comic book. Storyboarding used to be like doing a comic book. And it has become more like animation now. You know, if you're storyboarding, you're doing animation now. You're not really um, doing plans or layout like um, I used to do um, when I first storyboarded. What we do now is more like animation, which is, is fine. I mean, if you enjoy doing animation, the problem is, is that the people in charge don't realize, you know, they're, they're paying us the same amount of money for twice as much work. And that, that is the tough part is that as time goes on and computers can do more and more of the type of labor that we have spent our lifetimes learning how to do, they pay us less and less because um, it's labor intensive work and they just don't want to pay the hours that it takes us to do this work. And so, you know, I look, I, I feel that I grew up in an age that um, that I was at least treated for a while. They paid me what I was worth for the type of work that I did. And I, I hope that this generation gets to do that as well. And, and I mean, it really looked good there for a while when, when, you know, artists could go on the internet and find an audience and get them to pay for the the work that they did but it's getting to be uh, once again tougher and tougher and it's going to get tougher and tougher for um artists to make a living again and it always always has been a limited number of artists and a lot of times um it was people who were um who already had families where they made money who could support them or um, a lot of artists didn't need to make money or if you look like like Leonardo da Vinci his dad was actually um, well off and he had to find some place for his illegitimate son to make a living and that's how he got um, into an apprenticeship program it's like um, because you're you're from a rich family, you would get into something where you'd have a lucrative um, business, and that's that's kind of the way it's always been. It's not like that's not the way it's always been throughout history. Uh, you had a little bit of talent, but you'd still have to um, have a connection. No matter what, it's it's more about connections than it is your ability. It's a little bit of both. I mean, if you're really capable, um, you'll find something anywhere. But connections and, you know, it's, I, I never thought it would be that way when I had something like art. But it's, once again, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And then what you know. I mean, you've got to prove yourself no matter what. But it's always about making those connections and and being capable to do the job. Um, I think that, that um, part of most artists' problems is that if you're like me, I, I'm only outgoing to a certain degree. I only know enough marketing to a certain degree. And I really wish I was a better um, marketer than I am. Or I l like to do sales more than I do. Because I think that that, that would you know, make... The profession a lot easier. Maybe we do this eye. I'm not real happy with that eye. I'm not happy with his expression yet. But um, and that's the thing. You when you're uh, going back to the the drawing here. Um, 
it's like drawing and talking and talking and drawing but um trying to get the right expression on my animals is a big thing i like that's one of the things that being a storyboard artist was, has been so fun over the years is that you get to be the actor you get to act out all the characters and you get to be the film director because you're setting up all the shots you're setting up the pacing you're setting up the acting um and you're setting it up as the beginnings of what the animators down the line are going to do and you try to set it up as close to what you would like to see the final for the fact that um animation is one of those um professions where especially with tv animation or um animation for the web where it's got to get done in a hurry so because it's got to get done in a hurry in the past um as a storyboard artist i have always gotten to have a lot of the say in the creative side of things because people don't have time to you know make a lot of decisions so you get to make a lot of the decisions um but as time goes on it's it's um and the people in charge are actually not storytellers they're not artists they don't necessarily really like animation but they get to be in charge and they get to make the decisions and the more of them that get to make the decisions the less you get to make you know the more that it's closer to the animation they they will oh my lord the number of changes that they will make because they don't know what the heck they're doing and it gets more and more frustrating because that that you know the stuff that you used to do and you used to have the decision making and you are you knew what you were doing and then then you get in charge of these people you get these people who are not creatives they've gotten their positions because they got a business degree and used to be with that way with illustration whenever i did a lot of illustration work a lot of the uh, art directors came from sales or editing or something where they weren't necessarily creatives but they got to make the creative decisions and that's a lot of what's going on in animation these days you get more and more decision makers who are not necessarily in love with animation or they don't know about you know what it's like to create anything they they think that they understand creation and they don't and then they make decisions that you think are oh my god this is a terrible decision and i'm going to have to follow it because i am the lower person down the totem pole and personally it's like i've always liked to make my own decisions that's why you know being a storyboard artist is such a cool thing okay we're about to the the end just about done with our mirror here and again you'll not with this one i don't have any background i'm just i'm doing um the character i'm doing the the design of um the uh the piece and i don't have to we'll put some kind of background in here let's see what kind of mountains mountains of alley so it's going to be on a rocky shore of some sort let's see here Yeah, probably be a good idea. I'll put it, put some rocks in here. Just to make things interesting. So it's not just an empty background. And like I said, I'm I'm trying to uh, branch out. I'm going to be retiring soon. Um I worked union for quite a few years and when I get to be 65 I actually I'm lucky enough to have worked so many years in animation I actually get a pension in which case I don't have to worry about my art making me a living anymore and I can just make art to make art I can't wait to just you know do it th this is the kind of thing that I really enjoy doing I enjoy making these videos I enjoy um, drawing for friends that's another reason why, you know, it's like most people can't afford, you know, $150, you know, sketch. I mean, if I were somebody famous, you know, I could demand $150 for my sketch, but that's because I would be famous. Um, 
I've earned Emmys and I've done books, but I'm not yet. It's like you always hope for the fame and fortune. That's what we always want as artists. But um, even with Emmys and having worked on things like Animaniacs and Curious George and things of that nature, I'm, I'm basically, I have a middle class income. I have a house that I have a mortgage on that will eventually hopefully be paid. Um, but just because you work in the entertainment industry doesn't mean that you make a lot of money. I mean, there's there are artists and then, you know, it's just like with acting. Most actors are just extras. And the, the number of people who make, like, tons of money at it are few and far between. I've made enough to put a roof over my head and food in the, food in the cupboard. And I've been really happy with that. And uh, if you're interested in getting a sketch like this, or something like this, um, send, send me a I would like this to Lynn at lynnhunter at gmail.com and I'll do you, I'll draw whatever you want me to draw you for $20 and I'll put it in the, I'll draw, draw it, put it in an envelope, send it to you. Um, Christmas is coming. And that is a chimera. Let's see here. Do I want to put any clouds in the background? Nah, yeah, that's good the way it is. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me rant about um, being a professional artist and stopping by and watching me draw. And if you enjoyed this one, please stop by again. I'm doing regular um, videos on drawing and painting and what I do for a living and uh, hopefully it's something interesting for you to listen to. Thank you for stopping by. I really appreciate it. Like the video, subscribe to my channel. I have a Patreon and that's down below as well. If you just hit the more button after the description on the video, you can see materials and uh, where to find me on the internet. Thanks for stopping by. Bye-bye.